the back. All right. Great. Let's start. Uh, we need to be fast. Okay. So today's talk is actually going to be about LLDB. LLDB is something that most of you who are iOS developers have probably used. Hands up if anyone has not used LLDB before. All right. Cool. Everyone has. Great. That's the nice thing about asking questions that are negative from an audience because everyone by default will say yes. Okay, anyway, so today's talk is going to be about LLDB. And usually, when people, most people use LLDB, right? Most people will tend to use PO in LLDB, and that's all they'll use LLDB for, which is pretty good. But actually, LLDB can do a lot more things. And we're going to explore some of the things that LLDB can help us do. All right? It's going to be a, a, quite a few demos, so I'll try to be as fast, fast as I can. All right, so let's dig in. So this is today's agenda. First of all, let's talk about Poe, our good old friend, how it actually works, and some other associated cousins of Poe that LLDB offers. We're going to then talk about how LLDB switches between Objective-C and Swift context, and we're going to look into a detailed grasp of breakpoints, what different kind of breakpoints are there, and how you can use them to do more interesting stuff other than just being a breakpoint. And then we're going to dive into a bit on some internal stuff, like what's actually going on at runtime for Objective-C and Swift. In particular, we're going to be talking, spending some time talking about calling conventions, and this is quite an interesting thing, personally, I find. Uh, and then I'm going to show off some LLDB pro tips, which you can, some LLDB plugins that you can use that will make your debugging quite cool. Okay, so let's just dig right in. Okay, so everyone loves Po, Po the Panda, everyone loves him, right? Okay, so what does Po do, actually? Po, if you use it, it's just, you pass in an expression, it'll evaluate the expression in your debugger, and that's it. So that's why we normally will use this as a kind of have a print statement in our debugger. If we're debugging something and you want to print some value, you'll we'll just use PO and it works, right? Okay, actually under the hood, right, it will evaluate an expression and the debug output that it shows, we'll call this method on whatever object you pass PO. There's a, op there's a method called debug description. Debug description is implemented in Objective C, it's a base, it's, it's actually a base method of uh, NS object, or it's object implements the method, method, you can override it, and you can provide your implementation of debug description. If you are using Swift, you can conform to this custom debug string convertible protocol, and that's what it's not for. And uh, you will get, you need to implement this, you can implement this method as well, you also get it for free. There's a default implementation, or you can override and provide your implementation. So this is great, it works quite well for most cases, except until you need to modify the source code. Because let's say now you are debugging some SDK. You got this black box SDK from someone in Apple, okay, that you need to use. And you need to now add your own debug formatter to it. But you can't modify the SDK. How do you do it? Any ideas? Uh, how you how would you add your own custom debug statements to it? Like one way would be you can swizzle the debug debug description method. In the, in the objects they provide, or some, some do some runtime hackery, right? But actually, there is a much easier way, and that is using LLDB. So LLDB allows you to provide, so LLDB has like two more ways to for you to print objects. One is P, which is actually uh, just stands for expression. It will just evaluate whatever, whatever expression you give it. The only difference is that when it prints it, it will use the LLDB formatter to print it. Not, it won't actually go to runtime and call debug description. LLDB itself has its own formatter to format objects. And I'll show you later on how it looks like. And there's this other thing called frame variable, and you can pass it a variable name, which will also, which will not evaluate an expression, but it will just read the value from memory and it will output the LLDB formatted description. So the, the cool thing about this is, that the default implementation of this actually shows you all the instant variables of any object. So you can actually take a look at how internal objects, how objects implement certain stuff. But the other cool thing about this is that you can add your own formatters. So actually you can define your own formatter for any particular type. And that's why this is what, if you do this, then you don't need to edit the source code. So let's say for example for UI label, right? For UI label, if you use UI label, uh, if you pull it, you'll see a large string which will contain its layer, contain its text, contain a lot of information. And then let's say you have a lot of labels and you want to condense that information instead. So you can add a type summary in this way. Uh, this is like, come on, how do, how do I add it? And basically, 
when you run p on any label, it will just output this label and pass it the actual label instance. So I'll show a demo of this in a bit. But and there is actually a whole wealth of documentation on how you can do custom formatting on this thing. So this funny thing I showed you, the label dollar bar thing, it's how you can take, or it'll basically pass you the object that you call uh, the formatter on. And there's a million different ways for you to format this, uh, but good luck reading this doc. It's actually quite complicated. I tried doing some funky stuff with it, but actually it's very hard to use. So I ended up not using it much. So, but nevertheless, let me, before I jump to a demo and show it to you guys, uh, one problematic thing that we often face, right, whenever we debug with LLDB is, you are running, you are evaluating Swift code, and suddenly you pause the debugger, and you type something in Swift, and then it, it gives you some expression error, or says, hey, this thing doesn't compile, and you wonder why. And this is because LLDB supports both Swift and Objective-C contexts. What that means is, uh, LLDB, in L when you're writing LLDB, you, you can write expressions in both Swift and Objective-C, and whatever the current context is, it will use that context to evaluate that expression. So by default, let's say you're editing a Swift file, and you put a breakpoint in a Swift file, it will use a Swift context. But if you don't have any file, you just put a random breakpoint, let's say for example, it will actually default to Objective-C. So if you just like pause uh, implementation, or let's say you pause when you're doing view debugging, it'll actually use Objective-C. So you have to be aware of this thing, about what context you are using. And yeah, like I mentioned, it will default to Objective-C by default. And if you have a breakpoint, yeah, it'll use the language of the source file. And actually under the hood, if you know how, you, how PO and P are implemented, actually under the hood, they are just, they are just, uh, they are just aliases for expression. So expression is the unifying command in NLDB that basically evaluates any expression. And ex with expression, actually, you can pass it a lot more flags, do a lot more stuff. So for expression, you can specify the language, for example. So if I pass dash L Swift, then I can evaluate any Swift expression inside here to do anything. So for example, I can declare this new variable even. So you can declare new variables in your Swift expressions. You just need to prepend them with dollar for some reason, because I think they were missing basic too much. But like, it'll work. So you can evaluate this variable later on. Just one thing to keep in mind is that the variables are not shared between contexts. So if you declare a variable in Swift, it won't be available in Objective-C and vice versa. And yeah, we can evaluate the, we can use the layout, this L flag to indicate your language. And just one last thing before we move to the demo, working with addresses. So if you might have been bitten by this before, but in LLDB, if you do this, like let's say, let's say this address, right, this is a memory address, you were using new debugging, you found some instance address somehow, and you wanna, you know, you know actually it's a label, so you just wanna find the text. Then you run this, and if it's Objective-C, this is fine. You can do this, because Objective-C, anything can be an address, anything can be anything. Objective-C is beautiful that way, or <laughs> not beautiful, depending on your point of view. Uh, so Objective-C will have no issue using this address directly, but if you use Swift, this will not work. Swift will just treat this as a hex value, then it will complain what the, what the hell are you trying to make me do, because Swift is strongly typed. So for Swift, if you want to do the same thing, you have to go through this. You have to pass the address to this function called unsafe bitcast, which will, and you need to pass the unsafe bitcast a type, and then it will create a label for you, because the compiler believes in that the world is a structured place. It doesn't believe in the Wild West dynamic world of Objective-C. Okay, with this out of the way, I'm gonna show you a little demo app that I've been working on to de-stress, and I was, there's some bugs, so we're going to look at these bugs, some, we're going to clear these bugs, I and mean, our, our aim over here is to clear these bugs without recompiling the app, okay? So, there's a, so let me show you the app first. Uh, there's my Xcode, let's run this. And, uh, okay. So, uh, is this clear? Anyone can see this? All right, here I have... Uh, app. It's very simple. It does something that I really like. I like. I love cats. I have two cats at home. Okay. So every time I click refresh, it will fetch me a new kitten picture after some time. That's it. That's all the app does actually. Uh, nothing much. But 
I like this because it makes me feel better when I'm stressed, when deadlines are nearby. Nothing makes the heart feel better. Looking at that, like you look at that, you're like, okay, with the life. Well, the world is a good place now. Okay, okay, but sadly, the world is not a good place. As you can see, in my rush to build this, I have a few bugs here, right? Uh, you can see I didn't take care of iPhone X, so I need to take care of a safe area. You guys might know this. Uh, I'm a bad developer, so I did it. So this thing is over. This thing is bad. I need to move this UI somewhere. Then another problem is, for some reason, my loading indicator keeps spinning. I need to make it stop spinning after I fetch the image. So let's try to fix these two bugs. Okay. So let's try some live debugging, my favorite kind. Okay. So if you look at the implementation, uh, let me just zoom up a bit. Can everyone see the source code? If anyone cannot see, just give me a shout. You can't see? All right. Let's zoom in more. All right, can you see now? Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Okay, so I basically, for my in my uh, view, I have some constraints. So I have this kitten view, which has the image view. I have a status label, activity level, and a time level, and this total label. This total tell label tells me how many uh, kitten pictures I have fetched. All right, and you can see the bug is over here, right? Here's my bug. I put the bottom equal to super view, which is wrong because you should use the safe area layout guide, etc. Right? Okay. The bug itself is quite easy to fix. All I need to do is uh, need to do this. I need to insert this instead. Sorry. Over here, and then it will be okay. I, so what I do instead is I I make the bottom equal to safe area layout guide at the bottom and did some offset. Okay, this is quite easy. It's not it's not that hard. But I want to inject this change in without because let's assume that this app actually takes 10 minutes to compile because some of our apps do take more than 10 minutes to compile and sometimes the Xcode module caching doesn't work as expected. So sometimes builds take super long. If you're running an antivirus, fun fact, then it can take even longer than. 10 minutes. We had this funny case today where in turn took 40 minutes for our, one of our builds. So it, it, it happens. So let's say I don't want to recompile this. So how do I how do I do that? So one thing I can try is, and let me show this to you. When I do a fetch, I can create a breakpoint. So whenever I so whenever I click my refresh button, right, this method is triggered. At this point, I can let me try to inject some code so I can update this thing dynamically. Okay. And one way to inject the code is I can create a breakpoint. And with a breakpoint, I can add an action. So in this action, actually, I can evaluate code. So over here, what I'll do is I will write some code to update my constraint. Uh, And then I will just copy over what I changed here. Shit. This one is a bit hot to read, but it's okay. Uh. <laughs> okay, that's all. And I will tick this thing. This. Uh, you see this little flag automatically continue after evaluating actions. There's a little flag here. Let me zoom in a bit. Hold on. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. This. <laughs> yeah, this. This flag. Okay. No, I can't see it. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this flag, I will set this to true. So what this means is, this evaluating is a continuing, uh, an auto continuing breakpoint. This breakpoint. That means it won't stop the execution of my app. My app will continue executing after after it executes this bunch of code here. Okay. So this means this allows me to inject code. So I can inject code, and I don't need to recompile the app for this. So let's let's put this in. Let me. Okay. 
So let's see if this works. Uh, okay. Where's my there? Okay. And it didn't work. There's a problem. Ah, oops. Sorry. I mistyped something. My bad. Uh, what did I mistype here? Uh, hold on. Huh? Sorry, can't do new lines. This is one problem. This is one problem with this approach. You can't have new lines. So my bad. Uh, let me give me one second. Sorry. Uh, okay. I should it should compile it dynamically. Uh, All right, sorry, my bad. You're right. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> All right, yes, success. Yes. So sorry, it took longer than expected, but it works. Okay, so actually, I can do more than this. Uh, I will. Sh I was planning to showcase this la a bit later, but I will just showcase this. Let's say, okay, so I move this up a bit, right? And let's say I'm not, my designer, let's say is not happy with this UI. My designer says, this looks like crap. <laughs> I want you to move this around a bit, okay? Uh, so please change this. He says, please change this UI and, and, and show it to me right now. So in order to fulfill that request, I will, hold on, let me try to move this, put this in window. Okay. So what I can do is actually I can pause the debugger here. Oh, sorry, I can pause the debug. So I pause, hold on, one second, sorry. So I don't need this anymore. Uh, so I pause the debugger here on a real breakpoint. And let's say I wanna, I, I wanna move this around. I wanna move this variable around, okay? So one thing I can do, and this is a command that I already played around with, is, uh, what's this label called? It's called total uh, label. Let's move, let's move it up by, let's say, 100 pixels. Uh, Oh, sorry. I mistook the arguments. Hold on. All right. So let's see if that worked. Oh, it disappeared. Oops, sorry. I moved it down 100 pixels. So they move it up again. Because it's at the bottom, this command, this will basically nudge my view up, nudge my view in another direction. Sorry. Here we go. So I can so I can move this around like whenever however I want. So I can show the designer, hey, I move it here. So I move it. So I can I can I can sort of do this live by moving it around multiple times and stuff. And if you notice, I I'm still on the breakpoint. I actually didn't execute the code. I'm still on the breakpoint. I'm actually technically still paused, but the view actually re-rendered itself a few times. So I can use this to do some kind of live debugging slash show the user what. Show the designer, for example, hey, I'm moving this thing around. You want to see how, like, you can take a look at this. So, uh, the way this works, I will dig into this a bit later. How this actually, how this actually does, uh, how this actually works. But that's not the that's not the only thing I can do. Uh, and while we're at it, let me fix the other problem as well. Sorry, first. Uh, the other problem was that 
our activity indicator never stopped. And that's because I forgot to stop it after I'm done fetching the thing picture. So over here I need one more stop animating in my success case. So here I have a callback. I have a success case and I have a failure case. In my success case, I forgot to call stop animating. Right? It's a common mistake. So I can inject code here the same way I did just now. So I can edit this breakpoint. I can make it a non-continuing breakpoint. This one's going to be easier. So I just need to call animating, And this will automatically fix that problem. So let's just continue. And there we go. So let me remove this breakpoint. There, uh, wait, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, sorry. Not, why do this stop animating? Oh, yeah, it works, sorry. My bad. Yeah, it, it works, it works, it works. So if now the, that bug is fixed. Right, so I can, I can, I can, uh, so my, my point is you can inject code dynamically using non-continuing breakpoints, okay? So one more thing I want to showcase, another kind of breakpoint that we normally don't deal with often, is called a symbolic breakpoint. A symbolic breakpoint allows you to add breakpoints to code that you don't have. Let's say, for example, that I want to put a breakpoint on UI level set text. Okay? I don't have the source code for UI level set text. It's defined in UI kit. But I, still, I, but I want to put a breakpoint because I want to debug something that's happening in some internal system level. I don't know, I don't have much information about it. So one way I can do that is I can create a symbolic breakpoint. So to create a symbolic breakpoint, you go here. I can hold on. Let me zoom again. All right, can you see? Yes. All right. So I go to symbolic breakpoint. Then I can create a. I can write a breakpoint for any symbol over here. So let's. Let me do. Uh, UI label. Okay, and after I type UI level set text, the breakpoint will appear over here. Okay, it already appeared. Okay, uh, you can see the breakpoint is over here. In over here, sorry. You can see this breakpoint, right? There's two symbols here. One symbol is the. Uh, I added, I added, and this is the symbol name it resolved to, saying that it can found, it found this symbol name. Okay, and as you can see, my query was successful, my breakpoint is successful, and I already got a breakpoint over here. Okay, so you can see I broke broke point, I put a breakpoint on set text using a symbolic breakpoint. Okay, now, uh, but all I see is assembly here. This does not make much sense, right? It's hard to understand what's going on here. So our next job is to understand what's going on here. Okay? So actually, it's understandable. It's pretty readable if you... Oh no, hold on. One second, so sorry. Password. Yeah, I know, right? I managed... Okay, now I'm mine. All right. Just now I showcased symbolic breakpoints and... Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's 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 debug this. This is what I showed just now, right? So let's 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 try to understand what's going on here. Okay. So there's a few just to get a few easy hack out of the way. One easy way to find out what's going on here is to use this thing. So as so the LDB will define some custom registers, uh, pseudo registers, registers is that called? Dollar arc one, dollar arc two, etc. These will give you the arguments in the current function call. Okay. So I can use this to sort of get an idea of what's going on. So i just show you what happens if I do this with my current breakpoint. All right, so for example, if I, I do $arg1, oh, okay, I get uh, UI, I get something that looks, what exactly is this view? I get some view, 
I don't know exactly what view this is. Let's see what exactly this is. It's probably a UI view. Yeah, it's a UI level, sorry. It's a UI level. I put a breakpoint on UI level set text. There's some mysterious UI status quo string view inside there that is calling a set text. That is calling set text. I don't know why, but it's cool. I can find, I, can, I, mean, I, just, I found a new thing that this thing exists. I didn't know this thing existed before. And I know that, well, I know what it is. So basically R1 is the argument that this method is being, is being invoked on. So in this case, R1 is self. Like when you call a selector, when you, when you call object to C method, you need to pass an object, right, to call a method on. R1 is the object you're calling the method on. So let's try to see what's R2. R2 is some weird thing. I don't know what this is. This looks like a, this is weird. But usually in LDB, when you see this, usually this means you're, you missed a type class if you were expecting something here. So because I've read up a bit ahead, I know that this is a selector. So if I cast it as a selector, oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. So this is a selector set text. Okay, so this, tell, this tells me the second argument into this method right now is set text selector. And the third argument makes sense, would probably be the text itself that I want to set. So let's see the third argument, dollar $R3. It's this time. Oh, so this is the status bar time setting thing. So this is the status bar view that sets the time. It just so happens that I managed to catch it as the minute was increasing. So cool. I did not plan this, by the way. Okay. So, but what exactly is, what exactly are these values referring to? Let's dig it a bit deeper into that. So, in order to dig that, dig deeper, we need to look at calling convention. Okay, so what is calling convention? Before I go to calling convention, you need to understand how CPUs work. So, to give you a very brief summary how CPUs work, CPUs have this thing called registers. All right? And in x86-64, which is the architecture I'm currently running, the Intel 64-bit architecture, there are 16 general purpose registers that are used by the compiler. All these guys, RAX, BX, blah, 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 I don't care. Okay? So the idea in, is that when you make a function call, you need to use these registers in a specific way. The reason for that is, if my compiler uses these registers in a specific way, any other compiler can also understand the same binary. Because, when, let's say I'm doing a function call in something that's compiled with, by some other compiler, if the conventions are the same, then the, then based the meaning of the, what, what the CPU is going to do is going to be consistent across both, across, across both binaries. Okay? So that's why the idea behind here is that we should use these registers in a specific way. So let me make, clarify that idea by looking at C, everyone's favorite programming language. Okay? And the reason I look at C is because it's very simple. At least calling convention is C is simple. C is not simple. Okay, so in C functions like, the register ordering for function arguments is fixed. What that means is, when I provide arguments to a function and I do a function call, I need to put the argument somewhere. In the, I need to put the arguments in some registers. And the order of arguments has a mapping to which register I put it in. Okay? So for example, in C, in C calling convention, the first argument will go to this register called RDI. The second argument will go in RSI. Third argument will go to RDX. It doesn't matter for you. But my point is, it will go in this order. It will, C will always follow this order. Okay? And so on. And if you have more than six arguments, then they will be pushed on the stack. Okay? For those of you who don't know what a stack is, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this. Okay. So, uh, so that's C. And, and like if I was to look at some C code, right? Let's say I define this C function. Ignore this, I'm sorry. Uh, if I, let's say I define a C function called foo, okay, because I couldn't find a better name. And it takes three arguments, R1, R2, R3. All right, and it does something. I don't care what it does in the body. Okay, the, and let's say I call this function with these three strings, foo, ran, and dumb. I, I, I just came up with this late last night. Please, please forgive me. So, the assembly, right, if you look at the generated assembly code, if you convince yourself, if you look at the code, RDI will contain foo, the first argument to this 
So, okay, but just to make, you just need to look at two things over here. The first thing is this. Call Q means call a function. This is, this, is, this is the assembly for doing a function call at this address. And this address is the address of this foo function, as you can see by this comment here. Okay? So I'm calling a function called foo defined at this address in my code segment. Okay? And the first argument to foo is defined in RDI. And if you trace back, it will first load this foo string from memory into this, into this register, RDX. Then it will do a register move from RDX to RDI. So RDI contains foo at the end of the day. Okay, just convince yourself this is true. And you can prove, see the proof of my point that, hey, this actually is calling this in this convention. This convention is fixed, okay? So if you understand C calling convention, you understand everything, okay? Because objective C calling convention is just C calling convention on step, but with the important caveat. So in objective C, every time you do a method call, Actually, what's happening is it's a C function being called. This C function is called object C message send. Okay? So every time you do a method call, you are calling this function, and this function takes a bunch of arguments. The first argument will be the object that you pass that you need to call the method on. The second argument is the selector. Third argument is whatever other arguments you have. So for example, let's say I set text this rather controversial statement, and I call this set text on label, what this translates to at the lower level, at the assembly level, actually is object to see message send on label with this selector set text and this string, okay? And because this is a C function, the calling convention is the same as C function. So first argument is the receiver, second argument is the selector, then the rest of the arguments follow. So you can imagine the first argument, RDI, will be the selector. And this is arg1. So going back to my original thing that I showed you, arg1 is label, arg2 is the selector, arg3 is the other third argument. That's why I demoed this thing. In practice, you don't need to care about the registers because we have the pseudo registers and the calling conventions on different architectures are different. So no, it doesn't make sense for you to memorize the registers. In arm, there will be different registers. But my point is just to make you understand what's going on at the lower level. Okay. And now we come to Swift, which is a beast. So for Swift, if you found Objective-C and C boring, Swift will kill you. <laughs> so Swift, when it uses static dispatch, that means the, uh, the, the function is in a fixed place, in a fixed size part of the code segment, it, the calling convention will be similar-ish to C. I won't say it's exactly the same, because it's fucking complex. Okay? And the reason is, a few, I'll explain the reason why. But first thing you need to keep in mind is, remember, I don't know if you guys follow this, but who's heard of ABI stability? Anyone heard of ABI stability? Okay, great. So this is what I mean by ABI stability. ABI stability, part of ABI stability is calling convention. So how your binary, what your function looks like in binary, how it, what's the convention it uses for putting the arguments inside the, regi inside the registers, that is part of ABI stability. And Swift, as of now, is not ABI stable yet. That means you can expect the ABI, the application binary interface, to change with this version, on every version onwards. So that's also why when you distribute a Swift app, it ships with the Swift runtime libraries. Because it's not ABI stable yet, so it, doesn't, it, it can't use a fixed runtime library in the, in the system. Okay? So the... There's a disclaimer here for Swift, like I mentioned, because it's very complex. There's a lot more stuff aside from just registers that I did not talk about. So there's things like memory management, ownership rules, because Swift uses ARC under the hood. So those are the see actually. So who owns the memory ownership rules? Memory ownership rules, rules when you call a function. All that is also defined in the calling convention. Also whether you need to pass by reference or pass by value, how you lay out binary types, so far, we've just been dealing with more primitive types, but if you deal with structs and stuff, it becomes a lot more complex on how you add up your registers, what goes where. This is, there's a whole document on this. There's a, this very complex document if you want to read and uh, get more information about this, okay? Okay, cool. So that, that covered. So with that, since we already covered that, I'm also going to talk about another thing you can use LLDB for, which is if you want to reverse engineer stuff. Let's say I want to look up 
and see what methods are implemented in this library, or what method, what private methods are there, so I can play around with them and see if, if they can allow me to do certain stuff that I can't otherwise do. All right. Obviously, not similar to App Store. Okay. So LLDB right has this thing called image. So image command allows us to inspect symbols and their addresses. So it will help us invest, look at the binary and see everything that's in the binary. Okay. So here's a very simple command. Image lookup with some rn dash rn just means regular expression. So whatever regular expression you pass it, it will parse the regular because they find everything in the binary that matches this regular expression. So like for example, let's say I look at my Xcode and I'm at a debugger, which is great. So I do an image look up dash rn and let's look at UI label. Let's see all the methods on UI label. And whoa, that's a lot. So you can see there's a lot of output here, but my point is you can see all these methods that are there on UI label. This is everything that's defined inside UI label. And if I want to do some funky stuff where I want to play around with some private frameworks, this is how I would do it. I can find the private framework name here or private method here. I can play around with it. Then I can cry because I can't use it in App Store, but it's fine. Uh, at least we can explore and see how Apple does stuff. And if you want to reverse engineer some other third party app, or your competitors at, yeah, then yeah, you feel free to do this. Okay, so that's about image. Uh, one small thing I will do, or I will move on to the next demo is, so, like, so we, if, because we can do this, right, we can also look at how, ob how Objective-C works, how the runtime works. For example, like one question I've had, I've had ever since I use Objective-C was when I came across blocks, right? We think about block, it's a lambda, but where is the code stored? Like when you declare a block, the code has to be somewhere in the code segment, right? But where exactly is it and how do I put a breakpoint at it on the, on the code that's inside the lambda? Like one, let me show you a quick demo on how to, on, on doing that. Uh, so actually I skipped the demo since we're short on time. I'll just show you the results. I'll, I'll do the hack. Okay, so, okay, never mind that. So let's say, let's say, assume that I already did the demo, okay? So here's a breakpoint where I have a block, okay? This, this is interesting because I want to show you something very cool that happens internally. If when you pull, when you look at the internals of a block, right? A block actually is, is an object, okay? It's an object that's of this type, ns underscore underscore ns global block. This is one kind of, this is one kind of block object. And it has a reference to a function pointer and this function pointer is the actual body of the function. So when you call block invoke, actually it will call this function pointer. And this function pointer has a symbol name. So if you've ever seen this underscore block invoke thing, this is the name of this block. So you can put a symbolic breakpoint on the block by using this thing basically. And it, it, and it will work. Okay? This is how it identifies blocks. So let's say you have more blocks within this method, let's just increment this number here. That's how, it, that's how it basically finds blocks, okay? And yeah, like I mentioned, blocks is subclass of NS block. Under the hood, it's a function pointer. And the, if you notice one cool thing, the function pointer's type will match the type of the block, okay? So this is, I don't have time to go and show you this live, but I just believe, just take, it, take my word, okay? I'll quickly wrap it up. Okay, one last thing I wanna show you before I end is you can define your own aliases in LLDB. So let's say you use a command quite often, you can alias the command. And it's very simple to alias. You can just, so let's say I want to alias this expression of C, you can just define my own alias, alias this way. So that's how I did the nudge just now. And, and you can use command regex to do some more powerful stuff as well that I can't go into right now, I'm sure I'll die. How do you want to persist these commands? Because LLDB, every time you stop a session, all your commands will be gone, all your alias will be gone. Just hook it inside here. This, com this file called LDB in it, just put your, put your commands there. It will work. And finally, the coolest thing, LDB integrates with Python. So you can actually do a lot of cool things here with, if you have a proper programming language in LDB, which you do with Python. So this is a very cool project called Chisel, where Facebook implemented a lot of very cool plugins for LDB. So let me just show you a quick one, then I end, I, I swear. Uh, so for example, I'm at this breakpoint, right? Let's say I want to see the 
view, I want to print all the views in my hierarchy, all the, all the views right now in key window. I do P views, I can see all the views over here, okay? Then let's say I want to find all, I want to find an image view. So let's say I want to find an image view. I can do F view, oh sorry, F V. This will give me all the image views. And let's say I want to look at the image inside the image view. I can do this, uh, this new other command called visualize. So you know, I need to get the image out first. So let's look at this. This is the image view I can see. And uh, I want to visualize the image inside here, which is, oh shit, I need to pull the image, hold on. Uh, so here's the image. I want to visualize this image. I just do this, visualize, and it will open the image over here. Okay? So like there's a lot of different commands. This is the refresh button. This is how the, if you're curious how the refresh button is implemented, so the system refresh, this is this is what it looks like. It's actually a bitmap. And there is it's actually black in color, it'll use the tint color to change its color. Like I can do all these things because of the LLDB plugins. So check out Chisel. It's a, it allows you to do a lot of cool things like this and it will really empower your debugging. Okay? So if you want to do further reading, there's this very good uh, LLDB uh, session, this time in WDC. I recommend giving that a go. Uh, it, it's what inspired this thing, and there's a much better demo than I did. Uh, then there's this book that I read, which is, damn, which is damn good as well. It gives good to do a lot more detail about all the stuff that I mentioned. And other than that, yeah, Q&A. Anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. With that, yeah, it's the end of this talk. Yeah, you can I think we're going to take a short break, like for five minutes. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions, like feel free to ask as well. Feel free to walk around, and grab a snack if you want before we start the next talk. We'll reduce the break time to five minutes maybe to, to keep the time.